in all honesty, there's so many good sections in this part of the novel that I would like to read, and some of them are really long. Some of them are rather short as well, so... Uh, I don't know what we're gonna do, to be perfectly honest with you. I want to get those out relatively timely, although, to be fair, we don't need them to get out relatively timely, but I would like them to. So, um, I'll have to think about what we're actually gonna do with this, if we're... Um, if we're gonna read them all, or a couple of them, or if we're not. Either way, we're gonna get it up for a second. Uh, boom! Let's get it on the... Oh, no, 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 wait, 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 wait. I faked you out. Um, Alright, let's... Boom! Get it on the screen. Episode 12, right here. Right now, for us. Um, we do have... We do start out relatively dark, which is really nice because obviously we are well into the night and it's been raining all of well not into the night but into the evening and it's been raining all of this time. Lauren's doing something incredibly painful, but obviously out of worry for um, Nora's life being in danger and possibly even Holo being in trouble. Although um, I think at this point he has established somewhat of a trust with her. That he, he knows she's going to be somewhat fine, at least. Either way, he's in a panic. He, he's like, shit, if I'm not there in time, if we don't manage to get there. And this is when they... This is when they meet. Um, yeah. You look terrible, she says. Uh, well, I didn't mute that, sorry. Beautiful shots. Uh, I do especially love this one in terms of, like, composition. I don't quite know why, but... This, right, the two of them standing um, opposite of one another. He, Well, he he not standing, he, he's more like on the ground and, and heavily battered. Um, and her walking towards him here, clothes drenched. And interestingly enough, clothes still on, right? You immediately realize, oh yeah, um, she didn't have to transform or she didn't transform for a reason. Um... Right. Maybe she she found the peaceful solution. I'm not good natured enough to think that this was merely a tumble. Yeah. Um, and she's gonna be very angry, or she or she was very angry at the people um, that betrayed them. Yeah, burnt flesh is gonna smell very terrible. But he kept the coat, and and she's like. Jeez, you're you're such an idiot. Come on. Like, what are you doing? What are you doing? You could have just left the, the code alone. It's fine. It would have been fine. And we do have that conversation. I may kill humans. Right? I'm warning you. Like, the stuff that happened in the forest, and, and we see that, a flash of that, which I, I think is more interpret supposed to be interpreted like, um, at least if you read it in the novel, Interpreted like this is what Lawrence assumes and deducts from what he sees, right? Her knees uh, having mud on them and her still having her clothes, right? And the way the way she expresses that she, yeah, um, that she she's not angry to get on her knees. Um, but she is angry about this, right? She's like, look, you gotta get your priorities straight. I know that my, the code is important, whatever, but, but you were more important. I mean, obviously he didn't put himself in danger for the clothes, but uh, the fact that he takes more care and pays more attention that the code is actually all right while all of this shit is going on and he's badly hurt and all of that. Um, yeah. I mean, at the one hand, you do see that um, he cares a lot about her and, and doing right by her. And she appreciates that, but she also thinks that she's he's too too good natured, um, too good for his own good, right? Uh, as I said in the episode, do you have beautiful shots of her here in the rain and all of that? But he is like he he's begging for Nora's life because Holo was like, let's let her deal with it. Maybe she'll survive. Uh, at least that's that's how it went in the novel and. Um, that tongue of yours has become quite eloquent. Well, 
look who is talking, look who, look who taught him. Uh, at least to a degree, right? He was already eloquent as a merchant and whatnot. Um, and we do have that moment of like flirtatiousness where it's like, well, you ain't gonna praise that. Um, and he's like, oh, what a nice tale. And she does pay a lot of attention to her tale, right? And uh, takes a lot of pride in that. And that is why he knew that even though it's kind of a like a way to to weasel himself out of doing uh, making compliments as to her figure and and, and her sh shape and all of that and, and her nakedness. She still accepts it because it's a great like she loves getting her tail um, complimented. Uh, and this is I really love this. I really first of all, very, very hot the way this was shot and all of that. Right. And and showing just enough of the shapeliness and, and not too much. Um, you gotta know how to present something in order to make it really palatable um, and, and fit the mood of a um, of of a specific scene. And this is very fitting in that case. But what is also very, very cool is this transformation sequence, because this is the first time that we actually will or that we actually do see um, him transform. She still doesn't want him to see it. And he's like, uh, who am I to uh, to disagree? Because it happened in the past that it was problematic. I don't know what we're doing with the, the um, purple lightning. Later on, I didn't like it, right? I, I would have preferred like blue lightning the way you would expect it to be in disguise. Um, in this specific scene, I don't mind it. I think it is adding very well to the to the supernatural of the scene, right? Of the transformation itself. All right, we do have the squiggly lights, really cool. We start like getting all, all right, all undefined and with the hands, um, but you do see like the the fur is growing out of them. And it's really cool, like really well done. I I love that. We change the shape, we we expand this, and obviously we blow it out of proportion. We blow it out of the like frame of the camera, so to speak. Um, we do have that flowing motion, and interestingly enough, some kind of um, I don't know energy line going on. The, the, the raindrops are amazing. The raindrops flying off from from her fur as she uh, starts to starts to transform completely. Um, and at this point, we do see her face. I still think she looks a lot like a doggo, but I do guess that we do have to strike that balance between yes, she's a fearful wolf, but also she's she's still somebody who we can um who we can find sympathetic adorable whatever in that form um and it's very hard to strike that balance noble maybe as well right um something that fits her character as human sh like in in her human shape but that also represents something somewhat fearful and i guess like um this shape that is very much like, um, I would say, like a, a mix of a Shiba Inu and a Husky looks relatively good. Um, but it's more on the dark side and I don't like that. Uh, I, I would wish that it, it was a little less soft and a little more, bit more edgy in terms of like how it's drawn. Either way, he, he gets to ride her. Um, not that way. <laughs> Not yet. Um, and we do have a new new level of established trust, right? Um, we do have another moment where he's like, all right, I'm okay with you being in that form now. I'll accept it. Um, and I'll even I'll I'll even get on top of you and we're gonna um, we're gonna get there because times in a um, at times, a wasting and we we can't really we can't really waste that time love that right we we build up and we are <laughs> we are running right into the frame with lawrence being like holy shit i'm about to fall off yeah i mean cool all of that is amazing and the way she's drawn while she while she's moving 
really, really good. How she's, how she's jumping over them. And they're like, what the fuck is happening? Since when are wolves this big? <laughs> I mean, all they can say is Okami. Uh, but uh, how would you react if something like this happened? If you, if you, it's not even conceivable that there's wolves this big and, and you see a monster like that. You All you're gonna spout out is the first thing that comes to your mind. And in this case, it's wolf? Question mark? Um... And we do have that confrontation. Interestingly enough, we do see the horror scenario in, in Lawrence's head. Um, where she swipes away Enek and um, goes for Nora. But he chooses to trust her and I think that is okay. Although he has that moment where he calls for her, right? Although we don't know if it's for her or not for her. We do make a point of that later. And Nora knows the secret now. She's in. I mean, Liebert too. And leaving him alive is also a thing, right? He could be going to the church. We don't know. Um, But yeah, we're going to pressure the boss. And we're being very clever about this. And this is what I love, right? Lawrence, Lawrence thinks before he acts. He's like, look. And sometimes it's not that great, right? Thinking before you act, right? Sometimes you overthink it, but... Oftentimes, he's coming out of this be better than he might have, right? He could have run away with the money, but the way he does it, he's like, look, you can't pay us because you're fucking broke. But if we help you here, you break even. And what we're getting out of this is you declare your debt to us and you're going to pay that off piece by piece to my merchant company. And the good thing is he doesn't even need to stay within the vicinity or anything. He can just travel on. And the merchant company is going to be like, we're going to collect that. We're going to take our part because we provide the service of actually being here and making sure that that, that is actually paid. And after everybody is paid, you get something from that. And I think that is great, right? Because in times of need, in times of other needs, obviously, right? Sickness and, and all of that stuff. They're going to be there for him. And obviously, they're somewhat of a second family as we have noticed in those interactions. But yeah, um, we are waiting for Nora to return in this case uh, to see if the the, the thing happened. Um, and Lawrence kind of weasels his way out of it. It's, I mean, to be fair, he actually doesn't really know. I think he doesn't really know what he recalled, but maybe he did. Maybe he did we need to reread that. Uh, but either way, he's like, you know, I would have called your name probably, but I don't remember, right? So, I mean, when in doubt, fake, you faint any amnesia, right? Okay. That's the way to do it. <laughs> no, but she's forcing, she's like, all right, you're gonna call, you're gonna call my name. She's teasing him about it and he's using the, the clock tower. Interestingly enough, something that is not happening in the novel, in the novel, it's He's also using something else to actually not say her name. But um, he's not using the clock tower. That is that is an interesting image, by the way. Like the imagery of like the hill and the sun behind her, almost like uh, like some kind of um whatchamacallem aureola, like the the uh the aura, basically, right? That you have around like holy people, the holy shepherd. Um, but yeah, this is where we ended. Uh, like I said, tons of stuff to read. I don't know how much of that I'm actually going to read out. I, I really don't. Uh, I guess we're going to just going to get started. Um, the first one is actually from episode, um, 11, I think. Yeah, 11. Where they're sitting at the... Um, at the fire and they're actually looking to towards one another and um they are like nora and and lawrence uh when when Hall is lying in his lap and and, and Nick is lying in her lap um it's a very short scene um after a bland dinner lawrence sat deep in thought as he sipped some wine liebert had brought with no one to talk to he was left to his own devices Polo had quickly finished her own wine and was now wrapped up in a blanket, leaning against Lawrence fast asleep. 
Liebert tried, uh, Liebert tired and unaccustomed to travel, dozed before the campfire. Lawrence looked around and spotted Nora a bit farther from the campfire, stroking Anik on her lap. Evidently, if she stayed too close to the fire, her eyes would become accustomed um, to the light, and that could cause problems if something were to happen later. Nora seemed to notice Lawrence looking at her. She glanced over to him. She looked down at her hand, then back up, smiling pleasantly. For a moment, Lawrence didn't see why she was smiling, but then he looked down at his own hands and understood. Holo snored away on Lawrence's lap. The same as me, Nora's smile said. Lawrence, though, um, was quite afraid to stroke Holo's hair. The wolf on his lap was far more fearsome than Anik. As he looked at Holo, peaceful and innocent as she slept, the temptation to caress her grew keener. Surely there would um, be no problem if he mimicked Nora with Anik. Liebert was asleep, and Nora minded her sheep as she tended to Anik. Lawrence set down the roughly hewn wooden cup that um, he held and slowly moved his hands towards Holo. He had stroked her head many times before, but suddenly it now seemed somehow sacred. His hand trembled, then at that moment, Holo lifted her head up. Lawrence hastily withdrew his hand, Holo eyed him warily, but soon turned her attention elsewhere. Lawrence wondered what was happening when he noticed that Nora had gotten to her feet as had Anik, teeth bared. Everywhere he looked, it was the same. Pitch black forest. Mr. Lawrence, get back, <laughs> shouted Nora urgently. Uh, and mostly by reflex, the merchant tried to do as he was told, but he was caught on something and he could not stand. He turned only to find that it was Holo, holding fast to his clothes, keeping his hands behind him. He was about to protest when a warning glare from Holo over his shoulders pierced him. If he had to guess, the look meant something like, ignore the girl and get behind me. All right, <laughs> that was the scene I wanted to highlight. It was a very prominent scene last time. But we're going to move on to a scene that is just a little bit farther ahead when we are past the night and um, we get a little time to ourselves, Nora, Holo and Lawrence, um, sitting there waiting for Lieber to actually exchange the gold, right, for money to buy it. And Holo starts with her conversation with Lawrence, with the innuendos, like the double entendres. Um, and then she goes over to Enig and kind of teases Enig a bit, right? Um, and we're just going to jump in here. Then, taking a deep breath, she spoke, her nervousness, ev nervousness evidently dispelled. Actually, I thought perhaps you were a shepherd, Miss Holo. Uh, oh, because I was quick to notice the wolves? Well, there's that too, admitted Nora, pausing to look at her Blackford companion, who was content to pause in his work while his mistress had her chat. Actually, it was because Annex seemed to be very aware of you. Hmm, is that so, Holo, whose nerve uh, was such that she had no trouble exposing her tail when she knew she would not be caught. Smiled totally unperturbed as she folded her arms and regarded Annex. It's hard to say in front of a pet dog, but I dare say he's smitten with me. As if he had heard her, Anik looked back to Holo and then struck out once again to tend to the flock of the sheep. His mistress, on the other hand, was uh, struck dumb by Holo's words. What? You mean Anik is? My, it's nothing to be sad about. Any male will get overconfident if spoiled. I'm sure he's quite important to you, but that only makes him feel secure that he's gained your affection. There's no mistake, he'll look... Uh, he'll go looking for others to fro frolic with, no matter how delicious the bread, sometimes he wants soup. And obviously we do have the, the constant, like, double meaning that he's putting into that. Perhaps feeling some sympathy with Holo, Holo's intricate argument, Nora nodded, apparently impressed. Uh, put another way, sometimes you have to be cold. It's a good leash. Nora nodded firmly, as if she had been told some deep truth but then called Enix's name and crouched down to greet him. She caught him head on as he streaked over to her, then looked up to Holo and smiled. If, he's, if he ever has an affair, I'll keep that in mind. Good. The wrongly accused Enix barked once, but Nora put her arms around him and he was soon calm. I think I'd like to indulge him as long as I can though, said Nora, lightly kissing Enix behind his dangling ears. Holo looked on 
a slight smile playing out, um, about her lips. It was a somewhat bemused smile, inappropriate to the occasion, Lawrence realized when Holo looked at him. Because whether this job goes well or fails, I'll be giving up my work as a shepherd, said Nora quietly as she held Enig in her arms. It was clear that she had a firmly rational grasp on the situation and was prepared to act accordingly to that understanding. She understood both the position she had been placed in and the likely outcomes. Lawrence's concern was unnecessary. Though Nora might ha look frail, she had survived being cast out on an alm house and lived through any number of difficulties. She was not, pam not a pampered noble starter. At, at the same time, Lawrence had renewed respect for Holo. She had discerned Lawrence's misgivings and after seizing the conversation's initiative from Nora, casually drawn out evidence of how prepared the girl actually was. That explained Holo's bemused smile earlier. Oh, mostly. <laughs> The merchant wondered if Holo's pronouncement uh, that men were generally useless was not necessarily off the mark. Lawrence carved his eyes in defeat and then sprawled out on the ground to rest. The autumn landscape was cold with the approaching winter, but the scattered clouds in the sky looked warm. The smuggling would succeed. And yeah, uh, we do have a, a very nice picture of Nora hugging Enik here. Um, which I absolutely love that we do give detail to that uh, scene and you can really tell that she holds that dog very dearly. Um, I mean, I guess in a way wolves w wolves became dogs, right? Because um, humans kind of tamed them, right? They, they adopted them as, as companions and I guess wolves and, and humans are somewhat natural companions in a way, you might say. A little later here, um, we do have the scene where Lawrence realizes he's he's gotten betrayed, right? And and then and he gets stitched in the woods and, and frees himself. And now he's running because he knows that Nora's going to get killed as well. And that he still doesn't know where Holo is. This is where we start. A tearful reunion, eh? Eventually unable to contain himself, Lawrence had run through the rain and encountered Holo, just as he was running out of breath. Holo was in her human form, uninjured and looking much the same as when they had parted ways. The knees of her trousers were dirty, perhaps she had tripped somewhere along the way. You look terrible, she said with an amused smile. We are betrayed. I'm not so naive to think you saw that and fell, said Holo with a sigh. I cannot say it didn't occur to me they were from the company, yes? Her lack of surprise or shock suggested that she had vaguely anticipated betrayal, but since the entire plan was founded on mutual trust, she could not easily su suggest that possibility. For Lawrence's part, even if he had been told in advance, he would not necessarily have known what to do. It was an unmistakable reality that nothing would, could happen without the Romelio Company's cooperation. Holo smiled briefly and drew close to Lawrence, sniffing as she took his hands. She seemed to notice the burns. Honestly, I would have found you soon enough. You didn't have to do this. She twitched her nose again and struck her hand into Lawrence's coat, pulling the rope out. Holo seemed surprised and wiped her face against the cloth. Her drizzle-soaked face was much improved. She giggled. You are a strange one, protecting my clothes with your life. Holo's tail bristled in contrast to her delighted expression upon seeing the folded rope. When she looked back at Lawrence, she still smiled, and he could have melted into her burning eyes. There's something I need to say. I must be completely frank. She said her fangs showing when she flashed a grin. I may have to kill someone. She said, then continued before Lawrence could interrupt. I thought that if this plan didn't go well, I'd no longer be able to travel with you. The thought made me dreadfully lonely. Thus I bore it. I let it. I let things go peaceably. I came along with you quickly and I put up with things because I thought we'd soon be sipping hot potato soup in front of a fireplace. I am the wise wolf of Yuitsu, Holo. I can forget the pride of a youngster if need be. Lawrence looked down at the mud on Holo's knees. 
It had been no f normal wolf in the forest and it had not been after the sheep. There were few possibilities. A territorial dispute. Given that the actions Holo took to let things go peaceably became clearer and clearer. A wise wolf would never stumble clumsily over stone, dirtying her knees. No, listen. That was all well and good. I am Holo the wise wolf. If I am made to act like a mere dog, I... I shall still not be angry. But what is this? The soaked mouse standing in front of me, face swollen, covered in mud. Has my companion been so foolish as to trip and fall? And with burns on his wrists, oh indeed. Before me is a fine fool who doesn't give a second thought to his own appearance but protects my robe against the rain with his life. A dunce indeed. I have no idea what to do with such unbelievable soft-heartedness. Holo gave her whole speech in one long breath, then inhaled deeply as she rubbed her eyes. Well then, I take it we're off to Ruvenhagen. She said suddenly back to her normal self. Her arms and legs were covered with scratches and trembled. Lawrence didn't think it was because of the cold. This was hollow when she was truly angry. If we go now, we can enter the city under cover of darkness. The master always takes the responsibility for betrayal. This is the truth of the world. Hollow thrust her robe back at Lawrence, then untied the opening of the leather pouch around her neck and popped a few grains of wheat into her mouth. There was no hesitation. Wait! There's Liba de Nora, interjected Lawrence, now that he finally had an opportunity to speak. Holo's eyebrows shot up. Think it through. Betrayal demands revenge. Sin must have punishment. But plunging in without thinking will give us no satisfaction. We can't be satisfied until we've taken everything from them. Do you not agree? Consider, if we attacked a lot that came for you, dealing with the gold afterwards becomes difficult. But we'll go first to the master's house and make him good and sorry. Then strike at the ones who so happily betrayed you. Then we have to butcher, uh, but to butcher the sheep, take the gold, and go wherever we may, where, and go wherever we may please. I dare say this is the best plan. Despite her anger, Olo's mind was as clear and agile as ever. Her plan almost entirely eclipsed Lawrence's. However, there was a reason he had not. Uh, he had to abandon this excellent plan. I feel the same way, but we must first get to Liebert, and quickly. You have a better plan? asked Holo after gulping down the grains of wheat. Her expression was unreadable, and Lawrence got uh, the feeling that if he misspoke here, he would feel the full force of whatever swirled behind that mask. Nonetheless, he could not abandon Nora. The Romelio company plans to murder Nora. Holo smiled thinly. Yes, and those fools plan to kill us as well, yet you lived. She too may survive, don't you think? If you go save her, she will definitely be safe. Is that so? Lawrence found himself faintly irritated at Holo's mischievous look. Why was he acting like this? Time was short. If Nora and Liebert ran through the night, they might make it through the checkpoint to Ruvenhagen before dawn. And if it came to that, Nora would be killed shortly thereafter. The probability was high. You could defeat a hundred ma uh, armed men in a flash, could you not? Asked Lawrence impatiently, but Holo only took her head, uh, shook her head slowly. That is not a problem. Then what is the problem, Lawrence wanted to say. I am a wolf. The girl is a shepherd. We are eternal antagonists. For just a moment, Lawrence wondered why Holo was dragging that out again now, but then he realized something important. If Holo attacked Liebert and the others in her wolf form, it was quite possible that Nora would try to protect them. In that case, there was a risk that Liebert would kill Nora, so could Holo explain that she was only there for the Remelio man? Would Nora even accept them? Um, if she didn't, Holo would wind up playing the villain. Even in the best of times, Holo hated shepherds. It was obvious that she did not want to go to such lengths just to save Nora. And Lawrence couldn't force her to. I know there's nothing in it for you. Far from it, in fact. But c can I not ask this of you? An innocent person is about to die, and I can't just turn the other way. Holo looked, as um, Holo looked askance irritably as Lawrence tried to convince her. She was the only one who could save Nora. I'll owe some thanks, of course. What sort of thanks? 
As long as you don't say anything like, in exchange for a life, I'll give you whatever I can, said Lawrence, trying to strike out the possibility of Hollow making such a demand. Upon hearing this, uh, his words, her face turned severe. She had probably been keep uh, planning to do just that. Please, you're the only one. Holo's face stayed as irritated as ever as she hazily waved her sodden tail with discontent. She held her, um, she held her leather wheat pouch in her hands and folded her arms, exhaling widely in the cold air. Holo. Lawrence knew there was a limit to what he could do. Moreover, Holo had endured humiliation in order to his gold smuggling could proceed. So had dirty, she had dirtied her knees and um, been made, she said, to act like a dog. He could imagine any number of awful appearances that might have been forced on her. Then having endured that humiliation, she finds that her partner has been betrayed and made to look like a fool. He couldn't criticize her and was already thankful that she was willing to assume her wolf form and strike at Romilio company. Asking for any more was the height of selfishness. Holo exhaled a puff of air. She smiled, looking almost resigned. Come now, don't use that voice with me, she said, heaving a sigh. Here, take this. Also, I suppose I'd best take off my clothes. It would be troublesome to arrange for new ones. You'll do it? There's a condition, said Holo, as she undid the sash that held, held her trousers up. Her expression was unreadable. Lawrence gulped and waited. You'll understand if I don't guarantee the lives of those who bother me. If Nora took Holo for an enemy and protected Liebert and company, she wouldn't be spared no mercy, in other words. Or she would be spared no mercy, in other words. He couldn't tell if she was joking or not. No, she was surely serious. Holo had spoken without particularly looking at Lawrence. Her breathing was neither fast nor slow. Lawrence mustered all of his business cunning in response. Very well. I trust you. Puffs of white vapor appeared as Holo laughed as if giving in. <laughs> You've gotten quite clever. Exactly what sort of troublesome fellow am I traveling with? She shook her head slightly and quickly took off her blouse and trousers. She then kicked off her shoes roughly and after collecting them tossed them at Lawrence. What? No words of admiration yet, she said, putting a hand to her hip, turning around and looking over her shoulder. It was a small price to pay. It's a magnificent tale, Lawrence said. Hmm. <laughs> that was a bit monotone, but I suppose it will do. Holo turned to face him. Now then, be so kind as to close your eyes. She had no problems being nude, but evidently she did not want him to witness her transformation. Lawrence had no desire to oppose Holo on this. His feelings on the matter were complicated, as well he knew from the Pasio incident. He closed his eyes and waited. Soon there was a murmur, murmuring sort of rumble, like a great throng of mice running, and it was followed by the sound of something growing larger. What's the sound of something growing larger? <laughs> then, he had the sh um, then he heard sh the shifting of something huge waving uh, to and fro in the air and finally the heavy footfalls of a large animal. Lawrence felt hot breath on his face. When he opened his eyes, there was a gigantic mouth directly in front of him. If you'd flinched, I was thinking of eating your head first. Well, it is fairly frightening, answered Lawrence honestly as Holo's red-tinged irises seemed to stare right through him. He trusted her, after all. Perhaps she smiled a bit with her well-fanged mouth. There was a slight snarl. Shall I carry you in my mouth or on my back, then? To spare me your mouth, please. You might find it surprisingly comfortable. I might be tempted by the warmth and fight myself in your stomach. <laughs> Come on my back now. Grab on onto my fur, it won't hurt. Hold on as tight as you need. Holo's body had a mysterious heat to it, like standing by a campfire. Lawrence faltered a bit at her intimidating aura, which seemed to make even the rain move aside. But once he had roughly wrapped up her clothes and slung them under his arm, he did as he was told and, grabbing her fur, climbed atop the great wolf. She had an animalistic scent to her, unlike a human, but it was distinctly hollow nonetheless. If you fall, I'll snatch you up in my jaws. 
I'll make sure not to. He could tell that she smiled. You know what? I truly hate shepherds. For a moment, Lawrence didn't know why she bothered repeating this, but when he realized it was simply her true feelings, he pointed one thing out. Nora knows that whether this job succeeds or fails, she'll have to give up shepherding. Lawrence felt a low rumbling. Polo was growling. By the way of things, you best buy me more honey peach preserves than I can possibly eat. Then Lawrence was assaulted by a terrible sensation that he was about to slip off as, beneath him, Holo's huge body began to run. He held on to her fur for dear life, pressing himself down, desperate not to fall off the wise wolf, who accelerated with a shocking force. The wind in his ears sounded like a rushing, flooding river. And, uh, and this is where I ended. I do thank you for, for listening to, <laughs> to these ramblings. Um, I think I'm actually going to record episode 13, the review, um, tomorrow, or maybe the day after tomorrow. Like, we'll, we'll see. And, um, yeah, release them accordingly, right? Very close to one another. I, I will probably release a reaction immediately with episode 12. And we'll see when we get out the, um, when we'll get out the, uh, the review to episode 13. I don't know if I'll be reading anything on episode 13. Maybe we're gonna, um, I'm gonna search up the portions of the book, if there's any portions of the book that represent what we've seen in episode 13. I'm still not quite sure, right? I, I haven't, um, I haven't checked that out yet. We will have to see. If it exists, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get it, <laughs> and we're gonna read one excerpt of that. Um, if not, not. I really like how how our dynamic is staying mostly the same, right, in terms of feeling and atmosphere, but it's slowly changing. We have our protagonists, our our main characters, trust one another more and more. Um, we do have more people coming into the dynamic, and also leaving from the dynamic obviously as we go through the arcs um it remains to be seen if nora actually stays or not um after we're done with all of that I do have that little moment oh wait yeah i wanted to i wanted to actually read that it's, it's a super quick moment at the very end um and i was actually thinking of that i can actually um I can actually also um, read next time. I can read the afterword that um, Hasekura actually wrote in here, which I always love because there, there's some very interesting and cool tidbits going on there, um, where you have just amusing things that meta commentary by the by the creators and whatnot, which is really nice to read sometimes. But yeah, let me just read this super super short um, excerpt here. Um, Time was of the essence. I'm sure I would have unconsciously chosen to call your name. After all, all the script tightened. After all, it's one letter shorter. He all could almost feel the expression drop from her face. Also, if I shouted Nora even hastily, he'd be able to tell, but Holo takes but a moment to say it would be easy to miss with blood roaring through your head. What do you think? Quite a persuasive argument. He didn't finish a sentence because Hol because Holo struck him in the mouth. Shut up. Even her small, soft hand hurt quite a bit since Lauren's lip was uh, split slightly where the Romelio company Muk had struck him. So you called my name because it was shorter? Dance! Fool! She said, yanking on his sleeve. It's infuriating that you would even think that. She looked flatly opposite him as if to turn him away. Lawrence wondered if it would have been better to just tell an obvious lie, but he had the feeling Holo would have been angry either way. As they walked, they approached the east gate. There were more people around, now busily settling, uh, setting about their day. Holo walked slightly in front of them, alone. Just as he wondered what she was going to do, she stopped. Just... She stood there. Just call it out, said Holo, her back turned to Lawrence. Pastor Lawrence saw a bell at the end of a long staff. He heard the bleeding of the sheep behind the figure. 
What he saw beyond Holo was a shepherd girl leading a black sheepdog. In that very instant, he knew the smuggling had succeeded. He couldn't help but be happy. He might easily have called out Nora's name. Lauren smiled at Holo's clever, bald-faced actions. The moment he opened his mouth to call out the D name, he sneezed. <laughs> now the truth of which name he called out would remain forever a mystery. Holo looked over her shoulder, chagrined. He had gotten the better of her. Lawrence ignored her and waved broadly three times just as when he had first met Nora on the road. Nora ro noticed uh, and returned the wave. Holo regarded Nora over her shoulder. That was the moment Lawrence was waiting for. Holo. Her wolf ears twitched. Holo really is easier to say. A puff of vapor appeared at Holo's mouth as she exhaled, admitting defeat. You dunce. Lawrence loved her ticklish smile, um, even more than the warm late autumn sunshine. Right. <laughs> he paid her back for all the time she did that to him, honestly. Because she has been so mischievous, but this time he really nailed it. Yeah. I could not, I couldn't not read this moment, right? Um, yeah, that was my, my review slash light novel reading of Spice and Wolf, uh, episode 12. I do hope you enjoyed it. Uh, yeah, it's, it's a great novel. It's an amazing novel. Uh, and I'm gonna be seeing you soon, maybe in a couple of days or something, depending on when I get to edit Monster and Jujutsu Kaisen and bot, when I, and still need to like record Bocchi for the, for the next, um, or for this week. Yeah, but I'll be seeing you in a couple of days for the review of Spice and Wolf episode 13. And I do hope you'll be there for it. Mm.